And live from Crown Point Beach, it's the Mass Professor. and don't have to uh, uh, don't have to uh, try and uh, do this with a mask on for me. And with an incredible feat of timing, oh, <laughs> wrong chapter six. Uh, Stop share, share screen. Uh, that's not the one. That's oh, there we go. All right, this time for sure. So, Terrell, you there? Yeah, I'm here. What a man. Good. We finally got that sorted. Okay. Uh, so, here we are uh, in computer-aided manufacturing class. And we're going to talk uh, more about Chapter 6, Components of Automation. And we're going to talk about electric motors. All right. So... Uh, essentially, we have uh, four kinds of electric motors. We have DC or direct current motors, and the most common type is the, the direct current servo motor. We have uh, alternating current motors, where we have synchronous motors and induction motors. Yes. Oh, sorry. 
All right, this time for sure. Synchronous motors and induction motors. And uh, then we have stepper motors and linear motors. All right, so when we talk about a rotating electric mower, a motor, when we talk about a ro uh, rotating uh, mower, that's a different thing entirely. Um, typically, we have a mounting plate, motor housing, power cable, and a motor shaft is coming out of it. The axis of the stator field and the axis of the rotor field are offset. So that when we apply electricity, magnetism then begins moving uh, uh, moving the rotor and giving us rotational motion. Uh, we have uh, uh, the motor shaft and an air gap. Um, some types of motors uh, uh, don't have an air gap though. They have brushes that are in contact. All right, so we have a, a situation where we have torque on the y-axis here, and we have speed of the motor on the x-axis. Um, unlike a, uh, an internal combustion engine, a, a, an electric motor has torque at zero RPM. Um, so we have our starting torque here, our uh, motor's uh, speed versus torque uh, line here with a load and the operating point is where those, uh, where those curves uh, meet. A stepper motor um, works slightly differently. A stepper motor only moves so many degrees uh, uh, at a time on command. Uh, so we have a lock stepped, lock, locked step mode and a slewing mode. Now, a lot of times we want to change our rotary motion to a linear motion. Uh, so in this, uh, on this slide we see we have a motor that has a lead screw. The, uh, the lead screw has a, um, uh, uh, threads within the work table that move it along uh, either toward the motor or away from the motor um, uh, uh, as the motor rotates. We can also have a pulley system where this could be a, uh, a V-belt type drive or a conveyor belt uh, type of arrangement and the work table is fixed to that and moves uh, back and forth uh, in accordance with uh, the motor. And we can have a rack and pinion type arrangement uh, where the motor drives a pinion gear that moves a rack 
back and forward. So our linear motors, uh, a linear motor gives us a, a direct linear motion instead of having to convert a rotary motion to linear motion. Um, it can be uh, flat as in the illustration of uh, uh, section A of the diagram. It can be a U-channel type uh, as we see in section B of the diagram. Um, or it could be cylindrical where it, it is moved uh, back and forth. The shaft, but the shaft is moved back and forth uh, through a housing. Solenoids give a similar type of motion, but it's usually an all or nothing uh, type arrangement. Um, so we have a linear solenoid, here A is not in energized, the spring is relaxed, it's holding down a plunger, uh, the stroke is only so long, and, um, uh, and there are coil windings around this that then, uh, you'll notice the switch is open here. When we close the switch, the current flows in between these potentials and it pulls the plunger up, compressing the spring. Okay, so a solenoid has a certain amount of movement uh, but it is, uh, it is constrained by its nature. And uh, a uh, electromechanical relay, in A we see that it is not energized, the switch is open, there's a coil here, we have a low current or low potential. Um, the spring holds open the contacts uh, here. So when the uh, circuit is energized, we close the switch. That creates a magnetic force in this uh, coil that pulls the uh, switch closed in the high voltage circuit. Um, all right, so hydraulic and pneumatic actu actuators. Um, hydraulic actuators, well, first of all, they use uh, usually use oil, even though hydraulic comes from uh, hydro for water. Um, we consider that oil to be incompressible. It's capable of very high forces, but we consider this to be a low speed operation. When we talk pneumatic, we're using the same principle, but in that case we're using compressed air. The air is, can be compressed further. Uh, usually this is used for low forces, uh, but high speed operation. All right. So when we talk about uh, a cylinder uh, with a piston for either hydraulic operation or pneumatic operation, 
Well, first of all, we have two kinds. Um, the first is single acting, where we have a spring return, right? So there's a spring inside, and you put in the fluid, whether it's uh, uh, air or hydraulic fluid, to force the piston, force the, the piston up, actuating the uh, cylinder. When that uh, uh, fluid pressure is removed, then the spring is going to return the piston to its rest position. In a double acting cylinder, we um, put hydraulic fluid or air in one side or the other to move the piston back and forth and actuate uh, the piston. All right, so an analog to digital conversion unit an analog to digital converter converts a continuous analog signal from a transducer into a digital code that can be used by the computer. So it works in three phases. The first is sampling. It is going to convert that continuous signal to a series of discrete uh, analog signals at periodic intervals. Quantiz quantization, each discrete analog uh, signal is converted into one of a finite number uh, of discrete amplitude levels. And then it's encoded and, that, and those discrete amplitude levels are converted into a digital code. All right, so we have our uh, process with a sensor or a transducer that is sending a signal. The signal is conditioned in the quantization uh, process. It is mixed with other signals as appropriate, goes through an, analyze, uh, an amplifier into the ADC, and then that is translated as digital input to the computer. All right, so in an uh, analog to digital converter, we're looking at the sampling rate. How fast is the rate at which our continuous analog signal is pulled? The conversion time, how long does it take that sampled signal to convert to digital code? The resolution is going to depend on the number of quantization levels. And we have a conversion method, uh, and that means how do we translate that analog signal into a digital equivalent. So the example they give us is the successive approximation method. All right, so here we see we have our variable on the y-axis, time is on the x-axis. The analog signal is going along and it is sampled, oops, it is sampled at discrete intervals. Uh, so, in the successive approximation method, 
we have a series of trial voltages. They're successively compared to the input signal whose value is not known. The uh, number of trial voltages is going to be equal to the number of bits used to encode the signal. So our first trial voltage will be half the full range of the analog digital converter. Uh, so if uh, the uh, input voltage exceeds the trial voltage, then a bit value of 1 is entered. If it's less than the trial voltage, then a bit value of 0 is entered. The successive bit values are multiplied by their respective trial voltages and added, and that becomes the encoded value of the input signal. Um, okay, super simple for an industrial engineer like myself. Okay, obviously I'm lying when I say that. Alright, so here we have an example of the successive approximation method. We have an input uh, voltage um, and our first sample is, uh, is 6.8 volts. Um, so, um, to get that, uh, we have a binary digit, so we say 1 times 5 volts, right? It's obviously over 5 volts. Then from there, it's zero times two and a half volts, but it's one times 1.25 volts, zero times 0 0.625, one times 0 0.312 volts, and one times 0 0.156 volts, right? Thus making the number. Uh, one zero one zero one one. So, on our first try, five volts. Again, it's higher than five volts. So we take the leftover voltage. It goes to the second one. One point eight volts is not higher than two point five that comes over here, but it is higher than 1.25 uh, comes over here as 0.55, it's not higher than 0.625 it is higher than 0.312 and then it is higher than 0.156 now digital to analog converts digital output of a computer into a continuous an analog signal to drive an analog actuator or some other kind of analog device. So our digital to analog converter has two steps. First is decoding. The digital output of the computer is converted into a series of analog values at discrete moments in time. And then data holding, each successive value is changed into a continuous signal and that is going to last till the next sampling interval. Alright, so the first uh, illustration here is of a zero order hold um, and the 
uh, digital signal. Uh, here's the voltage, here's time. So the uh, first signal is translated here. Then uh, the uh, second signal is translated into this value. Uh, third signal into here, fourth, and so on over time. Uh, first order hold means that the digital signal is treated a bit differently. And you can see uh, we get this little dinosaur fin effect, if I may so describe it. All right, so input and uh, output devices for discrete data. For binary data, we can have a contact input interface, and that's just going to input the data to the computer. A contact output interface is just going to output data from the computer. If we have dis discrete data that is other than binary, then we'll have a contact input interface to um, input that data to the computer. A contact output interface that outputs the data from the computer. And then with pulse data, we have pulse counters that, uh, it may surprise you to find out, are going to input data to the computer. And then to output that data from the computer, we have pulse generators. These contact input and output interfaces, the contact input interface is um, contacts that are open or closed to indicate the status of individual binary devices such as limit switches and valves, okay? So the computer scans the uh, contacts and updates the values in the memory periodically. Uh, this could also be used for dis discrete data that is not binary, such as photoelectric sensors. A contact output interface communicates on-off signals from the computer to the process, and those values are maintained until they are changed by the computer. are pulse counters and generators. A pulse counter converts that series of pulses, which we call a pulse train, into a digital value. So that digital value then is entered into the computer through its input channel. The most common way of doing this is counting electrical pulses. We can use this for measurement or counting applications. And then our pulse generator is just a device that produces a series of electrical signals. So in that case, the number of pulses um, or the frequency of the pulse train is specified by the computer. chapter six. Now I'm sure you're bursting with questions. Just absolutely bursting. Any second it'll bubble to the surface. 
All right, maybe it won't. Uh, okay, uh, ordinarily, I would have somebody who is more familiar with these parts of automation teaching these chapters. Unfortunately, that was not available uh, this time. Uh, so you're going to have to bear with me. Can you not hear me, Terrell? Exciting development is chapter number seven. And that is about computer numeric numerical control. Uh, right, we have six exciting sections. All right, so the definition of numerical control a form of pro programmable automation in which the mechanical actions of a machine tool or other equipment are controlled by a program containing coded alphanumeric data. The alphanumeric data represent relative positions between a workhead, e.g. a cutting tool, uh, e.g. means for example, in case I haven't made that clear in the past, and a work part. When the current job is completed, a new program can be entered for the next job. Okay, well, of course, now our uh, computer numerical controlled machines can actually store many programs at once uh, and can execute them serially if it's on a certain part. Uh, all right, so the basic program, uh, bleh, basic components of our numerical control system, we have to have a program of in, uh, instructions, um, which uh, is called a part program in machine. A machine control unit controlling the process and our processing equipment that performs the process. All right, so this shows their relationship uh, to each other. The program feeds into the machine control unit, which um, is linked to the processing equipment and is communicating back and forth with that. All right, so we have, um, uh, we have to think in terms of uh, coordinate systems. Um, for example, here in illustration A, we see um, what I would consider to be a um, an ordinary XYZ type coordinate system. Um, uh, where we have uh, the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis, and then we have um, uh, we have rotation around those three axes. Um, 
for ro rotational parts, it begins to resemble more a um, uh, oh damn it, I'm stuck on the word. Um, uh, we only have two um, uh, axes though, the x-axis and the z-axis. All right, so our motion control systems, we have point-to-point -point systems, which um, we also call positioning systems. The system moves to a location and it does an operation at that location, whether that's drilling, milling, um, uh, reaming, whatever. Uh, this is also used in robotics. We also have continuous path systems, also called contouring systems, and the system can perform the operation during movement. Uh, right, so milling and turning fall into that uh, uh, situation. All right, so Here's an illustration of how the tool would move during a point-to-point -point control. Uh, the tool starts here, it moves over to here, then its tool path is over to position number one, where it drills a hole. It moves to position number two, where it drills a hole. And then it moves to position number three, where it drills a hole. And you'll notice that the angles are all 45 degrees or uh, 0, 90 degrees. For the continuous path control, the tool starts here, it goes along and then it is machining around this contour to make the correct contoured uh, part. So in this case, uh, this is profile milling. All right, so interpolation Um, we can have linear interpolation, and that is just a straight line between uh, two different points in space. We can have circular interpolation, where our circular arc we define by our starting point, our end point, our center or radius and, and the direction. In helical interpolation, uh, we have circular plus linear motion. And then we have parabolic and cubic interpolation uh, where we're using uh, uh, we're using higher order equations to define the curves that the machine will follow. All right, so when we talk about circular in interpolation, we can do that uh, in one of several ways. First is the uh, uh, inside um, where are we're approximating straight lines to build our curve um, we uh, in outside uh, so anyway that is 
inside where the uh, uh, we're cutting on the inside of the curve there. On outside, we're cutting on the outside of the curve, coming down to the curve. And then sometimes we are going to do both inside and outside the actual curve, throwing everyone into confusion everywhere. All right, so we can have um, absolute uh, positioning and incremental positioning. In absolute positioning, our locations are defined according to the origin of the axis system. In incremental positioning, um, the um, uh, our locations are defined relative to the position that it just was at. Please pardon me for stopping to fix the uh, slideshow. All right, so our current tool position is at 2020, right? We have uh, the x axis and the y axis. The next tool position is supposed to be at 4050. So in absolute positioning, we just tell it, all right, x is equal to 40, y is equal to 50. In incremental, we tell the tool to move 20 in the x direction and then 30 in the y direction. All right, so some other things that we can do with computer numerical control. First of all, we can store more than one part program. Uh, more and more, memory is becoming very cheap. And so we are, uh, 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 we're able to store more than one thing at a time, uh, right? Formerly, uh, uh, numerical control was controlled by uh, jacquards or tape. And so anytime you wanted to change programs, you had to load a new tape or a new jacquard in. We can edit the program at the machine tool uh, rather than having to do that somewhere else. Uh, we can have fixed cycles and we can have programming subroutines, right? So we can have a program for a part that allows for different uh, versions of that part to be made. Uh, adaptive control, uh, we can do interpolation. We have positioning features uh, for, fet, uh, for setup that help our uh, operator align our work part on the machine tool table. So now you lock down your part and very often the machine will have a probe. You touch the probe to a couple of positions on the part and the machine automatically adjusts and st can start working on it from there. Uh, we have acceleration and deceleration computations, uh, better communications interfaces, and we have diagnostics if something goes wrong. Oh, that's what I forgot is my T. 
person spoiled. All right, so a CNC machine control unit, first of all, it has uh, both read-only memory, ROM, or uh, ready access memory, RAM. The ROM is where the operating system resides. And the RAM is where we keep our, our part programs. Um, we have a, a central processing unit, a CPU. We have input-output interfaces. That could be an operator panel or a tape reader. Um, we have the machine tool controls. That would be a position control and a spindle speed control. And we have sequence controls uh, for coolant, for fixture clamping, and for tool changing. All right, we can have direct numeric control where multiple machine tools are controlled by a single mainframe computer uh, by direct co connection and in real time. Uh, so this is 1960s type technology and has two-way uh, communication. Distributed numerical control, also called DNC, uh, has a network of central computers, uh, uh, excuse me, a network with a central computer that's connected to our machine tool, uh, uh, machine control units, which are then uh, CNC. Okay, so that's our present day technology, and that also offers two way communication. So, a direct numerical control system again, it has that central computer, it has a bulk memory of uh, uh, numerical control programs. We have telecommunications lines in between those and all the machines it's going to control. And then we have um, uh, then we have communication to the machine control units, which may have tape readers or uh, may be controlled directly by the computer. Um, so, connecting to that machine control unit is behind uh, a tape reader, which they call BTR. Uh, but when we use distributed numerical control, no, the programs are downloaded to the machine control units, and it then is a CNC rather than uh, an NC. So applications that we use numerical control, uh, machine tool applications, Milling, drilling, turning, boring, grinding. Uh, for machining centers, turning centers, mill turn centers. Uh, other metalworking processes could be punch presses for hole punching and sheet metal bending, tube bending, thermal cutting machines, uh, wire electrical discharge machines, and welding. All right, so here we have common numerical control machining operations. 
we have turning um, where we have uh, a cutting tool is being fed down the uh, rotating part, uh, creating uh, chips and uh, a new surface. We have drilling where a drill bit is turned to make holes in the workpiece. Uh, we have milling where our, uh, our cutter is being fed uh, and we're cutting off a certain depth of material of the workpiece. And then we have grinding where uh, we have a grinding wheel that is actually removing material from the workpiece. So we have a uh, here we have a CNC four axis horizontal milling machine. Here it's got the safety panels on it. Uh, most CNC machines now uh, have uh, some kind of shields of this type. And here they've taken the safety panels off to show the work table can be rotated, the cutting tool is rotated, and the uh, work table can also be moved in the X or Z axis. Okay, so numerical control application characteristics for machining are the most appropriate for batch production, for repeat orders, for complex part geometries, when a lot of metal needs to be removed from a dark starting work part. We have many separate machining operations on the part, or the part is pretty expensive, and we can't afford to have mistakes made. Uh, in other applications of numerical control, um, additive manufacturing uh, is one, water jet cutting uh, and abrasive water jet cutting. Uh, those are technologies that have been coming into the fore in recent years. Uh, component placement machines in electronics assembly, um, coordinate measuring machines, uh, wood routers and granite cutters um, although when you make a router out of wood, it may not work with your computer. All right, never mind. Terrible joke. Um, tape laying machines for polymer composites and filament winding machines for polymer uh, com composite. Ugh, composites. Okay, so... Um, Numerical control can be used for a lot of different things. Um, basically for repetitive processes where we would like um, a lot of accuracy. Our advantages from using numerical control um, first of all, we're reducing our non-productive time. We have great accuracy and repeatability. Uh, this goes to help lower scrap rates. Our inspection requirement is reduced. Complex part geometry 
is made easier or sometimes even possible Uh, any engineering changes that need to be made made are easier. We can have simpler fixtures, shorter lead times, reduce our parts inventory and less force space. And of course, those of you who have taken lean production know that. And our operator skill level requirements are reduced. Now that may be true of the operator at the machine, but the operator skill level required for programming may be increased. Um, the disadvantages, well, first of all, there's a higher investment cost. Uh, CNC machines are going to be more expensive. there's going to be higher maintenance uh, effort. Uh, uh, the machines are more complicated. More complication means uh, more things can go wrong. We can have issues with the program. As I said on the last slide, we our need for more skilled programmers goes up. Every time we have a new part, even if it's based on an old part, we have to have uh, more time invested in programming. But uh, it's easy to repeat parts because we already have that program uh, available. All right, so here we see a numerical control positioning system. Um, all right, so this is uh, a motor and lead screw where we uh, where it's one linear axis only. Um, it moves a work table. The work part is on that and moves it so that the cutting tool can do its thing. If we have to have X and Y capability, then that has to be juxtaposed on another uh, similar type of uh, uh, motor and lead screw, uh, screw arrangement. two types of numerical control positioning systems. We have open loop where there's no feedback verifying that the position we're in is the position we desire. Closed loop, on the other hand, uses feedback to confirm that our position is the specified position. So, to achieve precision in numerical control pos positioning, we need control resolution, accuracy, and repeatability. All right, so in our motor control systems, A illustrates an open loop where uh, uh, this is essentially a, a type of uh, control that has been used for a long, long time in machining, uh, where the uh, uh, we have that lead screw uh, moving the work table, but we expected the operator to keep an eye on it to make sure it didn't go wild. 
With a closed loop, we have an input uh, uh, that uh, a, a comparator, a, a digital to analog control into the servo motor. Uh, we have an optical encoder that is reading how far it is and giving feedback back into the comparator. All right, so an optical uh, encoder is a, uh, we measure uh, rotational position and speed. Uh, uh, so uh, what we're doing is uh, they have a, uh, an encoder disk here. It has slots in it. We have a light source and a photocell that is measuring every time a slot comes around. And then we get an output signal that looks like our illustration in B here. All right, so we have three measures of precision. And we must remember that accuracy and precision are two different uh, uh, concepts. So the first measure of precision is control resolution. So that is our distance that separates two adjacent addressable points in the axis movement. Uh, Two is accuracy. What is the maximum possible error that can occur between the desired target point and the actual position taken by the system? And then repeatability is plus or minus three sigma of mechanical error distribution associated with the uh, axis. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, two, 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 two. so three plus or minus three standard deviations of our mechanical error. All right, so we look at this as um, our control re resolution. We have accuracy is going to be equal to our control resolution divided by two plus three standard deviations. Our repeatability is going to be equal to three uh, standard deviations. Our uh, numerical control part programming can either be manual part pro programming, con computer assisted part programming, CAD CAM part programming, or manual data input. All right, so we can have a binary coded decimal system each of the 10 digits in the decimal system is coded with a four digit binary number. Our binary numbers are added then to give the value. So binary coded uh, decimal is compared as compatible with eight bits 
across the tape format the original storage medium used for numerically controlled part programs. 8 bits can also be used for letters and symbols. Um, and I do not know if they teach this uh, in your computer uh, uh, computer uh, classes these days, uh, but uh, uh, for example, a keyboard actually only has um, a five by five grid, and how those are activated tells it what letter or symbol or number. All right, so. Creating those instructions in the, for the numerical control. Uh, a bit is either 0 or 1. So it's absence or presence of a hole in the tape. A character is a row of bits across the tape. Uh, A word is a sequence of characters uh, uh, and then a block is a collection of words to form a complete instruction. And then a part program is a series of blocks uh, that gives us a sequence uh, that we're working on. Uh, block format uh, is organizations of words uh, within the block in a numerical control part program. So this is also known as tape format because the original formats were for punch tape. We can use a word address format, which is what's used on modern CNC controllers. In that case, we use a letter prefix to identify each type of word, spaces to separate words within the block, uh, allows any order of words in a block. Words are omitted if their values uh, haven't changed from the previous block. All right, so the uh, types of words, uh, N is a sequence number G, uh, prefix, not gfix. Um, G are preparatory words. Uh, the example I give is G00 uh, equals point-to-point uh, -point rapid traverse move. X, Y, and Z are prefixes for X, Y, and Z axes. F is the pre, uh, feed rate prefix. S is spindle speed. T is tool selection. And M is miscellaneous command. The example they give is M07 equals turn cutting fluid on. Okay. Um, I am uh, going to ask to pick up uh, with this next time uh, because my voice is just about shot today. Uh, are there any questions? I did have a question on chapter homework two. You have it in there twice. Which one do we do? Because I started the first one. It says homework two and then homework two again. It says homework two again. I'm sorry. You have two homework two assignments in there in Moodle. Oh, assume that one was actually that the 
Second one is actually homework three. Oh, uh, you have a homework three in there already, so. Okay, then how about 2A? 2A, okay, so do the first one that was given, okay. Uh, well, I would go ahead and do, uh, put one down as 2A and one down as 2B and do them both. Okay. Uh, okay, well that was a good question. Uh, any other questions? All right, I am going to come back and restart uh, part programming uh, next time. Uh, so thank you very much, um, and uh, we will pick this up next Monday. So Marcy, how's your life otherwise? Mm, it's busy. Well, I hope that's a good thing. 